Hello, I'm Ryan Kobrick. I'm a professor at Embry-Riddle Aeronautical University in Daytona Beach, Florida. We're here in Greece at the end of an intensive four-week summer abroad program where students were learning about spacesuits and human spaceflight operations. In this program, students are taking classes anywhere but a classroom, taking topics in space and relating them to their own adventures abroad. While they understand what it takes to explore Earth, in order to explore space, they must first understand what allows humans to venture beyond the safety of our own planet, the spacesuit. Humans should always be considered at the center of design, and being human at the center of that. Study abroad opens doors to our universe, and it's up to the students to take that next step into the cosmos. It will change your life, and you'll learn how to know thyself. Okay, all flight controllers, gonna go for landing. Retro, go, Rido. go, guide, go, control, go, telecom, go, GNC, go, ECOM, go, surgeon, go, Capcom, we're go for landing. Humans are designed to live on Earth, so whenever we try to go beyond our atmosphere, we must reconstruct the conditions found on Earth in order to survive in our new environment. To do this, astronauts must wear specialized suits. These suits come in two different categories, intravehicular activity, or IVA, and extravehicular activity, or EVA. Overall, a suit must be able to provide protection from the variety of risks that are associated with being in space. On EVA, the suit should provide pressure to protect the astronaut from the vacuum of space. To provide thermal regulation for the astronaut, a liquid cooling garment circulates cool water throughout the suit to keep the astronaut from overheating while performing tasks. The suit should provide breathable air to the astronaut while also removing carbon dioxide from the suit. The Apollo astronauts breathe 100% oxygen from their PLSS, or portable life support system, which they carried on their backs during EVA. While inside the vehicle, the cabin regulates the temperature, air pressure, and oxygen levels. In addition, it protects the astronaut from the cosmic radiation and micrometeoroid impact. Therefore, IVA suits are generally used during launch and re-entry or as a backup in case of an emergency. An IVA scenario is usually initiated by spacecraft decompression and is used to protect any disaster. When designing spacesuits, the main factor is the human wearing the suit. It must fit and be comfortable because EVAs can last as long as eight hours. In addition, an astronaut on EVA needs to be able to use tools to repair equipment or on planetary EVA perform experiments. In order to use these tools, the astronauts need high levels of dexterity, mobility, and visibility. To meet these requirements, the gloves need to be designed to increase range of motion in the hands. To allow the astronaut to bend naturally, bearings and flexible materials can be used for joints inside the suit. The visor must include protection from the sun's radiation and allow the astronaut to move his or her head with a wide field of view. Also, various lights and cameras should be readily available to the astronaut to increase visibility and spatial awareness. Despite these requirements, humans have been performing successful EVAs for the past 50 years, thanks to spacesuit technology. Now that we have a good understanding of what it takes to survive in space, it's important that everyone has an experience of what it might be like to live there with a crew. Having a group crew is essential for an isolated, confined environment, and for two weeks the students lived on sailboats while sailing on the Aegean Sea. For the group to be successful as a crew, they'll need to work together. They'll need to be tough, and they'll need to be competent. The dangerous perils of early explorers sailing across the oceans to discover treasures from beyond or new homes to settle all had a common goal, pushing the limits of our personal and collective capabilities. In terms of spaceship simulations, being on board a sailing boat with 10 other individuals is a good analogous environment in my opinion. From a strictly layout perspective, you deal with a constantly changing, cramped, and noisy environment. Sleeping is done in small cabins with one other person. Spaces usually are compact and modular, as in, despite their size, an area may have many uses. For example, your restroom is also your shower, your kitchen is also your rec room, and bedrooms are all your storage rooms. Not to mention the boat engines directly next to your rooms, where you can either be lulled to sleep by the vibrations of the engine, or chart awake by its noise. These sort of conditions with so many people tend to lead to people bumping into each other and needing to cooperate efficiently if they're to make the voyage. This mirrors the living conditions reported from the ISS. Most of its usable space is taken up with storage and astronauts often comment on the constant noise level of the station. And when you put 10 living bodies into that sort of environment, it can create some very interesting situations. To talk about this, we spoke with our captains and a student to get their unique view on crew relations in both space and sailing. So the sailing portion of the trip lasted 
two weeks. We got to moor offshore a couple times for one or two days, and that was the best facsimile for being on a spaceship or a space station due to having to stay confined to the ship with the 11 people counting our captains to Matis and cooperate. Well, to be, to be an efficient crew in sailing, teamwork is the, I think it's the most important thing. Uh, the spirit of uh, creating a team and being uh, able to help each other, fill each other's needs and the needs of the boat and be focused on the mission that you have, either being winning a race or uh, just having a good time, you really have to work together to get this happening. You must uh, help each other and uh, cooperate uh, for uh, the safety reasons. In this small area, the sailing yacht for Game Club, uh, you have to have uh, your uh, personal place, but uh, you have to share things uh, and food for, uh, with the other crew members. The most important one I would have to say is to be open to change your daily program because uh, there are a lot of people in a confined, well not confined, but a rather small place and there are several things that need to be done every day. What Marita mentions here is a great point about daily life aboard the ISS. The astronaut's daily schedule is basically wake up, work, and then go back to bed. Every minute of their daily life is planned down to the minute to increase efficiency. And while a schedule on a sailing boat isn't usually as exact as NASA's, we tend to keep a loose itinerary for the day in order to help the boat stay on track. The sailing trip acted as their first bonding experience for the class and crew and helped pave the way for relations here on out. There comes a time when every astronaut has to leave the safety of their vehicle to either go out on EVA in zero-G or explore the surface of a new world. To simulate the low-G environment and conduct safe operations where the team is dependent on their life support systems, students will don their scuba gear and try to moonwalk on the clear Aegean seafloor. Training is important for learning about operations and not everything can be found in textbooks. Don't trust, verify. To train astronauts in low-G environments, NASA uses the Neutral Buoyancy Lab, or MBL. The MBL is located at Johnson Space Center in Houston, Texas, and utilizes a giant indoor pool to test space hardware underwater. Like the MBL, we can perform similar tests in the ocean with the addition of weights on a scuba diver. This will simulate the gravity on other celestial bodies such as our moon and even Mars. For our simulation, we chose to mimic the environment on the moon by using calculations to figure out what weight needed to be added to a diver to simulate the moon's gravity. Rob was one of our demo divers and will now talk about the calculations and his experience underwater. Each diver is going to have to calculate their weight differently in order to simulate lunar environment underneath the water. Let's do an example problem. To start, we're going to take the hypothetical weight of our diver, which is about 175 pounds. Well, now we're going to multiply that by 0.1, because when you go scuba diving, you need to attain neutral buoyancy, which you do that by adding about 10% of your body weight through a weight belt. So in this case, this diver needs 18 pounds of additional weight. Now we're going to take that diver's body weight again and divide it by 6. This way we can get what their body weight would be on the lunar surface, which is about 29 pounds. Now we're going to take that 29 and subtract 18 from it, since we already have that added weight there, and we're going to find out that we need 11 extra pounds in order to simulate lunar gravity underneath the water. Now we're also going to take the PLSS weight, which is about 50 pounds, and divide that by 6 as well, since we're bringing it along and it's going to come about 8.3 pounds, which means we need about 19.3 pounds of additional weight in order to simulate lunar gravity here on Earth. The process of the dive is to have three different simulations, and on each dive we did different speeds of walking as well as jumping and picking things up to simulate some of the activities that astronauts would do on an EVA. We even simulated falling and getting back up to experience a consequence that many Apollo astronauts had while performing activities on the moon. Now the first simulation was to remove the flippers underwater and do a basic walk with no added weight, just the normal scuba gear. The second simulation was the addition of a second weight belt to simulate the gravity on the moon. Additional walks then occurred with that second weight belt. And then lastly we did another simulation with the weight belt added to the oxygen tank. This simulated the PLSS on the back of the scuba diver and shifted the center of gravity just like astronauts on the moon. Now, the first simulation, I actually kind of felt very light on my feet. 
Uh, it was very different to walk on the, on the sea floor with no flippers. Uh, I had to shift my arm position a little bit to make it easier to walk, but I tried to limit myself to the same limitations as the astronauts in their spacesuits. On the second sim, the extra weight gave some added stability and it made it comfortable, but you could tell that it was exhausting if I were to do it for long periods of time. And then lastly, when the PLSS was thrown on, it was I could definitely feel the shift in my center of gravity, almost like I had to lean forward in order to move at the same speed I was doing before. Now, the simulation really gave us, the students, a better understanding of things to consider in the future spaceflight and spacesuit operations. Once astronauts arrive on a new terrestrial planet, they're going to experience the harsh conditions of the environment. They're going to need a clunky but necessary spacesuit. To learn about extravehicular activities and careful planning that goes into successful analog mission, the students hiked one of Greece's tallest mountains and stayed overnight in a mountain refuge analogous to a space habitat. This was no stroll in the woods. The hike was grueling and everyone had to work together so that no one was left behind. To make it, the team had to be strong to the finish. Today, the students will be hiking the Ostraka Mountain in the Zagori region of Greece. This is a moderately strenuous activity, which allows us to do basic research into human workloads, energy consumption, and consumable usage. With these three topics in mind, this makes this an ideal exercise for a terrestrial EVA analog. Suiting up to protect from hazards is necessary before any space activity. Proper footwear is required for traversing the difficult terrain ahead. The best option are strong, resilient materials to protect from rocky and dusty environments. Legwear must be strong and flexible for optimal movement and protection. The outermost layers of clothing should focus on protective and thermal elements to prepare for a variety of different environments. Most importantly, the right piece of headgear is necessary to combat light and heat from the sun, keeping its wearer breathing easy in any situation. On today's hike, students will need to utilize the backpack to carry all of their gear. Basic necessities include food and water, for which we'll be using dried pineapple and 1.5 liter bottles. Emergency supplies consist of a map and phone or GPS for navigation, as well as a whistle and first aid kit. Now, we're ready to go. Our crew has begun the hiking EVA up to the top of the mountain, Estrada. We are being led by our mission specialist, Yoni, as we ascend to the habitat. Uh, so Yaris, what is the best way to save energy during a hike? Uh, the best way is all the time to keep a pace and not change your pace and uh, try not to carry with you uh, things that they're not useful and uh, that means you have to be lightweight all the time, only the important things with you. One of the many hazards that the crew will face on this hiking EVA is overheating due to the sun and physical activity. Lightweight suits with high mobility decrease the physical demands on the wearer. Overloading the body with unnecessary weight can overwork an astronaut and put them in a dangerous situation. Minimizing energy consumption is the key to maximizing available time on an EVA. Each crew member has a limited amount of resources. Rationing consumables is an important part of every EVA. Let's go to Rob to see how he rationed his consumables. Hello there. Well, with me, I think I overpacked a little bit on water, but I've got a Camelback with two and a half liters water bottle which I could just refill with uh, about one liter and I've got six granola bars just like this uh, that's pretty much it this is our final resting point before we reach the habitat all the crew is taking a quick break and preparing themselves for the final stretch of the journey the crew has finally finished the hiking EVA we are now preparing to enter the habitat. This habitat helps to protect against the harsh mountain environment, much like a lunar or Martian base will. It has solar panels covering the outside to provide needed power in this isolated area. Power is then limited to daylight hours starting from 8 a.m. and going until 10 p.m. To prevent contamination, shoes are taken off before entering the habitat. Sleeping conditions inside are very cramped and thus lack personal privacy. These conditions are similar to other space analogs, such as high seas and FMARS, this experience has given the class an idea of what an actual space analog might be like. And with that, our month-long journey across Greece came to an end. As a class, we learned a lot about spacesuits and what it takes to keep an astronaut safe in space. We also learned how to simulate space missions here on Earth. But most importantly, we learned how to travel and share our experiences with others. 
If we're all focused on leaving Earth someday, it's important to explore and get out of our comfort zone and experience the best of what Earth's got to offer. Oh, one last thing. Don't forget to... Space suit up! Spacesuit up! Spacesuit up! Spacesuit up!